The theme of this year's conference is nature and its meanings. I'm Larry Cahoon. The conference is being generously supported by the work of Holy Cross Information and Educational Technology staff, especially Patricia Chuplis, Jim Cahill, Holly Hunt, Najee Kashi, and by our own webmaster, Dan Stambowski. For technical problems, please contact Dan or myself, for example, on email. <clears throat> Sessions will be recorded so that after the conference, with the consent and approval of speakers, of course, uh, we may be able to post some of them on the Society's new YouTube channel. I also thank our scheduled participants from last year for the willingness to stay the course. We're saddened that one presenter from last year cannot be present. That would be George W. Shields, who passed away in August. His memorial session is Sunday at 10 a.m. Now to our keynote speaker. Mario De Caro is professor of moral philosophy at Universita Roma Tre and visiting professor at Tufts University since 2000. He's worked in philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, and psychology, ethics, and philosophy of film. He's the winner of a Templeton Foundation grant. He has been visiting professor at multiple universities, including Warwick, Lugano, Madrid, and Warsaw, and lectured widely, that is widely, maybe wildly, uh, but widely, including at Harvard, Princeton, Heidelberg, and the Sorbonne, in Italian, he's the author, the author of a number of volumes, perhaps most importantly, Libro Arbitrio, Una Introduzione. In English, he's the editor of Interpretations and Causes, New Perspectives on Donald Davidson's Philosophy, and of Hilary Putnam's Naturalism, Realism, and Normativity. He is co-editor with David MacArthur of Naturalism in Question, Naturalism and Normativity, and philosophy in the age of science, met physics, mathematics, and skepticism. Also, cartographies of the mind, philosophy and psychology in intersection with Massimo Marafa and Francesco Ferretti, and most recently, practical wisdom, philosophical and psychological perspectives with Maria Silva Vacarezza. He serves as well as Hilary Putnam's literary executor. DeCaro is one of our most prominent and dogged workers in the field of what is often called non-reductive or perhaps better pluralistic naturalism. His version, characteristic of a term taken from John McDowell, a liberal naturalism opposes a restrictive naturalism that accepts natural science as the sole arbiter of knowledge of reality. If we wish to see how pluralistic contemporary naturalism can combine an analysis of the semantics and methods of science with the breadth of our humanistic and aesthetic concerns, I can think of none better to turn to than Mario De Caro. His presentation is entitled Naturalism and Pluralism. Please join me in welcoming him insofar as it is remotely possible. Thank you to everybody. I'm happy to be here with this uh, uh, ancient society. Well, and uh, not as ancient as metaphysics, but still very ancient. Um, so my uh, issue will be uh, naturalism and re um, uh, pluralism. And I take here pluralism um, especially, but not only in the ontological sense, has the opposite of monism. Uh, so will be why a naturalist should be a pluralist, more or less what I want to say. So I try to share, I have a PowerPoint presentation. Well, um, so uh, I will define naturalism first and then realism here, and, and then why we should be pluralist. Uh, as long as we are realists. Uh, so there are different versions of naturalism, um, a little historical framework here. Um, 
the terms that are used as labels of philosophical conceptions generally are time independent designators like realism, skepticism, atheism, or idealism. So Piro would be, would be was a skepticist when he wrote and he still is considered a skeptic for contemporary, in contemporary, using contemporary standards or Marx was an atheist then and still would be an atheist and so on. While with naturalism, the issue is different. And the reason of this is that uh, all, def all definition of naturalism, even the ones that are used today, hinge on the idea that there are no entities or explanations that should be accepted that go beyond the natural. That's very general, but the terms nature and natural have changed dramatically over time and they are still contentious. So for this reason, the term naturalism uh, changes its meaning. And so for example, um, Giordano Bruno or Spinoza, perhaps, or, uh, or uh, you know, uh, Heraclitus, who were considered naturalists for their own times, wouldn't be considered naturalists nowadays because their, um, their uh, view of nature was very different from ours. <clears throat> and so um, also consequently, the boundary between the natural and the supernatural is variable depending on how one interprets the term natural and nature. Um, nat supernatural or perhaps more, more mildly anti-natural. Uh, so I would say that there is the natural, the anti-natural that is wider and the supernatural that is not just a denial of it, um, naturally it also uh, claims the existence of um, supernatural entities. Uh, this variability is evident in the course of history to the, the ch great changes of scientific paradigm. So science before Galileo and New Newton uh, was different from after them. And so uh, with uh, Darwin to make a couple of examples. And of course, uh, uh, it, it was still different after the great revolutions of, in science in the uh, 1900. Um, so uh, still, Nowadays, even nowadays, there are uh, sharp differences uh, between people who call themselves naturalists because what uh, there are differences about how they define what is natural and what nature is. Okay, uh, what is nature? Uh, uh, okay, first a little uh, uh, another historical uh, remark. And this is at the end of the 1500, when really science started to divorce from common sense. Uh, that's important because the science, the, uh, the philosophy that follows science, since then divorced it common self as well. So this is a friend of and a colleague of Galileo who writes at the end of the 1500 about a sharp division a big, a, among two intellectual parties, the Aristotelian and the Platonist. Now, there were many groups of Aristotelians and many groups of Platonists. These are two very influential ones, specific ones. Uh, the, the Aristotelians were the ones that said, we can only trust perception. And the others were saying, no, perception can in some sense deceive us. What really matters is what science tell us, tells us. And science tells us that only primary um, feature properties exist. And so the, of the bodies that we perceive, only the, primaries, the primary properties of these bodies are really real. So this is how uh, Mazzoni describes this. And Galileo strongly approved this passage. It is well known that Plato believed that mathematics was quite particularly appropriate for physical investigations, which was the reason why he himself had many times recourse to it for the explanation of physical mysteries. That's a, you know, perhaps in the, time is, but uh, it's not that Plato was really a physicist. Still, with the time use and the Meno in part, he started a, a, a conception that was very uh, strongly, uh, he became a lot of strength at the end of the Renaissance, uh, together with the discovery of Archimedes. Plato and Archimedes together were the origin of the philosophical sources. But Aristotle had a quite different view and he explained the errors of Plato by his Plato's too great attachment to mathematics. So the idea was, do we have a geometrical world, the world 
that the physics tells us about, or we have the world of perceptions in which the quality is as what, what is more important. Talking about the Aristotelian categories, for the Aristotelians, the most important categories were quality and modality. For the Platonists of this kind, uh, the main categories were quantity and relation. Okay, so this was the beginning. And then the scientific, scientific revolution uh, occurred and things uh, changed a lot in philosophy. Now, anyway, within traditional naturalism, nature goes beyond the subject matter of the natural sciences. It's not for, for the traditional naturalism, at, at least at the, until the beginning or the half of the 19th century, the 1900, uh, nature was not only the subject matter of the natural sciences. So this is John Dewey, for example. Mind and matter are different characters of natural events in which matter expresses their sequential order and mind the order of their meanings in their logical connections and dependencies. So there is the nature that is studied by the natural sciences and there is nature perhaps studied by um, the social sciences, the human sciences, uh, philosophy, and you know, what else? Uh, and interpreted by common science, perhaps religion can have a saying here and so on. So it's not that nature is only the subject matter of science, <clears throat> but what happens today? Still, uh, this is controversial now. Some people, some many people, many philosophers argue that um, Nature is only the subject matter of the natural sciences, perhaps only the subject matter of physics, and perhaps even of microphysics. Uh, this is quite. It is within science itself, and not in some prior philosophy that reality is to be identified and described. So uh, science tells us what nature is, and plus there is nothing more than that nature. And this is Hilary Patram instead especially if I'm able. Okay, the world cannot be completely described in the language game of theoretical physics, not because there are regions in which physics is false, so it's not a supernaturalist, it's not even an anti-naturalist, but because to use Aristotelian language, the world has many levels of forms, there is no realistic possibility of reducing them all to the level of fundamental physics. So the world, nature, is more than what the physics and the natural sciences tell us about. Let's say, say more about this. There are three meta philosophies at stake, I think, if we look at this issue here. One is non-naturalism, and that includes also supernaturalism. So simply, naturalism is false. However you describe nature, there is something more. Uh, some, the, this could be, you know, the, like uh, Derrida certainly wouldn't say that nature is the only thing. There are other things, society cannot be reduced to nature and blah, 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 something like that. Language cannot be reduced to nature in any sense. And then there are the strongest one, the ones that say like, uh, for example, uh, a friend of mine, Charles Taliefer, that says that there is something that simply goes beyond nature, like so immortal souls, so gods or these things. That's also, of course, uh, in, uh, a perfectly acceptable metaphilosophy, just is not naturalism, it's not, is a form of non-naturalism. Then there is, this, let's call it strict naturalism, sometimes I have called it scientific naturalism, but that's of course there's other uh, little uh, problems with the other terms. So I prefer now strict naturalism, the idea that only the natural sciences tell us what science and nature is. And then there is this liberal naturalism that is pluralistic about nature, so in ontology, pluralistic about epistemology, and also pluralistic in metaphilosophy. So philosophy can be done in different ways. Um, now, what is the connection of these three metaphilosophies with the issue of realism? And so consequently, the issue of monism versus pluralism. Uh, let's talk about two different forms of realism here. One is, I think, uh, the, it is useful to, there are different ways, of course, of talking about realism. That's the one I think is very useful in order to discuss these issues. And is, it is the distinction between perceptual realism and scientific realism. And this, look, is exactly what uh, Mazzoni in his uh, description of the debate at the end of the 1500 was describing. One idea that reality is, is what the 
perception tele telecities. And the other one is that reality is what science, natural science uh, tells us it is, okay? So these two view, views about realism. Uh, look, logically, these two forms of realism are not incompatible with each other, but frequently they are taken uh, as they, if they were. So to give it, you a little, little summary of my whole lecture, um, what I have called um, perceptual realism uh, is, uh, uh, would deny that uh, scientific realism is possible or uh, is uh, uh, allowable or is mm, right, and vice versa. Who defends scientific realism will deny the legitimacy of perceptual realism. That's very common. My idea and the idea of the liberal naturalist is that this uh, unilaterality in understanding realism is unjustified. We may and perhaps should be realist about both what perception tells us and what science tells us. That's my idea. Okay, so two forms of realism. One is this perceptual realism. And so the idea is that the things we can experience directly through perception or indirectly with the instrument that extend our perceptions, uh, perception like uh, the microscope or the telescope. Oh, okay, these things are real. Um, and then this is the opposite view. The world contains the entities, properties, and events, both observable and unobservable, that are in principle describable by science. And, and taken in their purest forms, this is what I was just saying one minute ago, these views are radically alternative since each of them is becomes a realist in the field in which the other assumes a first realist attitude. So normally people are either perceptual realist or scientific realist if they are realist uh, altogether, of course. And I think, why not think that we should, could be both at the same time, okay? That's my view. Uh, Non-naturalists tend to accept only perceptual realism. Strict naturalists tend to accept only scientific realism. That's more or less what happened uh, if we uh, put together the issue of naturalism and the issue of realism as I presented it. Um, and so in this way, both families of views have a monistic attitude, both in epistemology and in ontology. Whereas I think liberal naturalism endorses pluralism, both in epistemology and in ontology. There is an issue uh, by a very good issue by a by paper par, 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 by um, John Dupre called the miracle of monism. Yeah, that's the, I thought some people should read this. There is too much monism in a contemporary philosophy in one sense or the other. <clears throat> so perceptual realism. This area is a list of people that from different points of view, of course, defended, uh, defended perceptual realism. That they, are not, they don't say the same things, but they have something in together. Uh, same, something in common. So Aristotle and most of the Aristotelian tradition, Thomas Reed, James, Hugham, Bergson, Moore, Husser, Wittgenstein, Sartre, uh, Merleau-Ponty, and Austin. These are all defending some ideas, moral, in, moral lies. These are the ideas I attribute to this movement, that be, besides all their differences, of course. Apart, apart from special cases like uh, dreaming or Per, um, per, or optic illusions and so on. Perception gives us access to the external world as it really is. Observable objects really have the primary and secondary properties that on the basis of perception, we tend to attribute to them. So notwithstanding what Galileo, Locke and et cetera told us. Middle sides objects have properties that are not identical to whatever microphysical properties constitute them. <clears throat> no descriptions of middle uh, middle size objects have only mentions that only mention its physical properties could account for their qualitative, functional, axiological, normative, or aesthetic properties. That's it. These properties, higher level properties, are, are irreducible to the physical properties of the, 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 the bodies. So to give an example, so if I have a chair, the chair has some physical properties, but it's uh, Functional or aesthetic properties cannot be explained by talking about their physical properties. Okay, this is the idea. You, you start to see the, the, uh, the pluralism here. And that's very important. 
Norms and values, values are essentially reducible components of our perception of the world. So the idea often is that <clears throat> norms and values are either they are reducible to uh, natural, in the sense of this uh, natural sciences properties, or they have to be eliminated. Okay, no, this is not the position of perceptual realism. Let's take crisis, for example, Husserl. Husserl um, takes these views to an extreme and that's very common nowadays, to the extreme. Um, on the one side, he says, uh, the view that, you know, using phenomenological analysis of Kurtz, he, and um, uh, reaches the conclusion that perception more or less describes the world as it is. But he, al he also adds something more, he says, um, only through perception, uh, we can talk about the world. He says, <clears throat> Galileo performed a surreptitious uh, substitution of the mathematical substructural world of idealities for the only real world, which is actually given through perception, which is ever experienced and experienceable, our everyday life world. And, and the substitution, so the Galile Galileo's uh, geometrical abstract entities became the only real world. Why the only real world is the world of perception. This substitution was promptly passed on to his successors, the physicists of all succeeding centuries. And we could add, you know, in the last uh, uh, 90 years or so 85 years, also the uh, ph philosophers, many philosophers of the succeeding centuries nowadays. Okay, this is important. Uh, Husserl mentions the only real world. The only real world is the life world, the world of human experience. In, the, in this world, there are values, there are meanings, and the secondary qualities do really belong to the external objects in which, uh, you know, uh, through perception, we would commonsensically locate them. Uh, this is the forgotten meaning fundamental, uh, meaning fundamental natural science. It, so the genealogical conceptual fundament of science. And I think that's perfectly right, of course. <clears throat> but then he adds, scientific concepts are mere idealizations with practical purposes, such as measurement and prediction, but do not refer to any unobservable reality. So for him, uh, science, when he mentioned things that we cannot perceive, like atoms or, uh, or uh, black holes, they do, do not talk about real things. They are only... Uh, um, structures, um, concepts that we use, but they are idealization. We, they don't, we cannot take them as real descriptions of the world. So anti-realism about science. Uh, in one word, I take Husserl um, positive side for correct. So I think he's right about the world of perception. I think he's too strict about the world of science. Um, but it's some people could say, okay, this is continental philosophy, you know, that's a typical move. What about analytic philosophy? Yeah, what about analytic philosophy? This is Bas van Frassen, one of the greatest, uh, very good philosopher of science with his constructive empiricism. That resembles, in some sense, Husserl. Let's see why. He writes, his view is called constructive empiricism, not to be confused that, you know, human company empiricism. Constructive empiricism is set squarely within a common sense realism that was foreign to my too much of the empiricist tradition. So uh, you remember uh, th th Thomas Reed, common sense realist versus uh, Hume that was instead an empiricist. So constructive empiricism is more with uh, Reed than with Hume. He says in this light, the common basi basis I assume is language in which reference is unproblematic to trees and mountains, people and books. So Van Frassen is a realist about the world that we perceive. Empiric but, as similarly to Husserl, empirically, empirically adequate scientific theory that appeal to unobservable entities may be useful heuristic tools, but are not true descriptions of the world. So again, he's anti-realist about science. So all these views uh, argue, claim that all these people, philosophers argue that we should trust perception more or less about what exists out there, but science doesn't add much to that. Now, this is a form of non-naturalism in some sense because it doesn't trust science enough. Uh, 
in appealing to an observable entities and properties, the natural sciences go wildly beyond what perception, this is what a perceptual realist would say, of this kind would say, uh, the natural sciences go widely beyond what perception tells us about the external world. Um, and so this is a, a non-realistic instrumental attitude uh, that we should, as, should assume towards the unobservable entities posited by the natural sciences, electrons, radiations, black holes, they, they are useful tools. This is an instrumentalistic view of science, of course. So in this light, perceptualism is clearly a version of nat non-naturalism in the sense that I assume that all forms of naturalism, even the liberal ones, should credit science for contributing to, to um, understanding how the world is done out there. Not only science, but also science. So this view, the, the neg negative side of perceptual realism, so the anti-scientific view, has some problems. The most important, I think, is the famous no miracles argument that was Hilary Patra among, among others, perhaps more than others, uh, stress. This is the idea. It's very simple. Science has been increasingly successful in giving explanation, explanations and in making predictions about the natural world. A realist interpretation of this success is the only one that does not make it a miracle. Okay, so this is an argument. We have sent, uh, you know, uh, our uh, uh, fellows on the moon on the basis of science, on the basis of theory of relativity about uh, quantum mechanics. So if this science was wrong, was just, you know, an idealization, why should it work so well? It would be a miracle, right? Like in a game of bingo, one gets it all, all um, numbers in advance. There has to be an explanation, it cannot be an, a, a, a miracle. And the idea that Patrama has and that I share, and then more or less um, our best theory of uh, scientific theories are, even when they appeal to uh, the existence of unobservable entities are correct or approximately correct. Um, this is the structure of this argument. Uh, the, the argument cannot be, sorry, the, this argument, can, that there are many ways of uh, attacking this argument that no one is effective really. No one explains alternatively why science works so well if you don't assume that science talks about the world. Uh, and so the no miracles argument justifies scientific realism, okay? Because the idea is that science tells us what is out there. Scientific theories are true and the entities that this theory assumed existing uh, exist really, okay? That's the idea. Uh, so scientific realism is justified and Consequently, we have to accept the reality of the unobservable entities postulated by our best scientific theories. Uh, in one word, this is a, a, a meta explanation to, um, to the best, sorry, a meta abduction, a meta inference to the best explanation. It says that we, when we use the inference to the best explanation to assume the existence of atoms, this, uh, this inference to the best explanation or abduction as Peirce would call it is correct, okay? Because there is this meta inference to the best explanation that says, okay, what else, how con could you else explain the success of these scientific theories if you weren't a scientific realist? So there are good, this is a very good reason <clears throat> to be a scientific realist and no coincidence nowadays, for example, in quantum mechanics, uh, the vast majority of scientists is a realist and also in the field of philosophy of quantum mechanics. While 50 years ago, many of them were instrumentalists. The things have changed also because of this argument, not only of that, but also of that. Um, and, so, and then secondly, there are new forms of scientific realism that could appeal to some. Uh, uh, one is, uh, that's a very interesting uh, new view. The, the idea that our best theory do not describe the intrinsic niche nature of features of the unobservable phenomena to which but rather their structure. So the relation this phenomena enter into. We don't know the nature of the atoms, but all the relations they, or some of the relations they uh, enter into. And these relations are real. And there are two interpretations here. One is epistemic structure realism. Okay, we have epistemically limited, so we cannot really understand the nature of these entities, but we understand their relation. The second one is spectacular. It's the most anti-Leibnizian 
theory in the history of philosophy, ontic structural realism. There are no unobservable objects, but only structural features. So there are only relations, no entities. Exactly the opposite of what um, uh, Leibniz said. Okay, besides these two interpretations, the idea is that there are milder forms of scientific realism some people are happy with. So this is another reason to be a scientific realist nowadays. Uh, you don't have to buy the entire package. You can be happy to say that science describes reality, describes reality, but even when the science talks about the unobservable entities, but we can to think that science only describes their relations. Some people are happy with that. Okay, now, um, so this is the positive side of strict naturalism it is a form of scientific realism that strict naturalist endorses, but they commit uh, a sin that's similar to the ones that we saw before with the anti-naturalists. So they say, this is our only way of knowing reality. They don't give credit at, to perception at all. And that's too much for me. Uh, so the idea is that today, uh, more or less scientific realism and, and uh, in the majority of cases, scientific realism coincides with strict naturalism, okay? So you, if you are a strict, probably people who are scientific realists are also strict naturalists and vice versa. Um, liberal naturalists are an exception because they are scientific realists, but they are also perceptual realists. So they are not strict naturalists at all, but that's the exception, let's face it. So what are the three tenets of strict naturalism? So the idea that only science tells us about the world. There is an ontological tenet. Reality consists of nothing more than the entities to which the successful explanation of the natural sciences commit us. And there is an epistemological tenet. Scientific inquiries are our only genuine source of knowledge. All other alleged forms of knowledge such as a priori knowledge, phenomenological knowledge, introspection, are either reducible in principle to scientific knowledge, and so just um, they don't add anything, or they are illegitimate. And there is also a metaphilosophical tenet. Philosophy must be continuous with science as to its contents, methods, and purposes. Famously once, for example, describing epistemology, quite said, you know, epistemology is just the it's just a form of engineering. It was ironical, but it was ironical uh, with uh, uh, saying something that philosophy is just a part, should be a part of natural, the natural science, the natural sciences. Um, you see the strong monism of these th three tenets, ontological monism, epistemological monism, and metaphilosophical monism, in the sense that philosophy doesn't have any specific uh, method, any specific content, any or any specific purpose. It, it shares them all with uh, the, science, the natural sciences. Oh, this is quite. Nothing happens in the world, not the flutter of an eyelid, not the flicker of a thought, without some redistribution, redistribution of microphysical states. A full coverage in this sense is the very business of physics and only physics. And his ontological criterion famously says that we should accept in our ontology only the entities that are uh, part of the best scientific theories. Look at how it goes from the first one that everything that happens in the world um, is also due to the redistribution of microphysical states to the idea that physics has to cover this all. Okay, so a strong form of monism, both in epistemology and ontology. And this is another one, Wilfred Sellers. Uh, that's very interesting. So uh, Sellers was a, a Buffalo a student of Marvin Farber, Farber, who had been a student of Husserl. So he takes Husserl idea that, you know, there is this genealogy between from the manifest image to the scientific image to use his own terms. And then he it just uh, reverse the weight of these two views. And he says, and uh, he adds this, this combination of utter, utter respect for the structure of Husserl's thought with the equally firm conviction that this structure could be given in naturalistic interpretation was undoubtedly a key influence on my own subsequent philosophical strategy. So it's the opposite. He says the opposite of Husserl. Only what science tell us is true, uh, real exists. Look, this is his most famous quotation. Speaking as a philosopher, I'm quite prepared to say that common sense uh, the common sense world of physical objects in space and time is unreal. 
That is that there are no such things. There are no such things. There are no table in some sense. He says speaking as a philosopher, not speaking as, you know, scientist. And then he has his famous neo-protagorian uh, slogan, or to put it less, less paradoxically, that in the dimension of describing and explaining the world, science is the measurable thing. So what it is, uh, what is what that it is, and what is not that it is not. So this is Quine and Seller said the founding fathers of strict naturalism. And these are some contemporary uh, uh, the advocates of this view. Patricia and Paul Churchland, the defendants of the Canberra plan, they have a credo that everything should be reduced to the uh, to the microphysical, Hartrefield that says that, you know, for example, mathematics is false because mathematics substantially doesn't behave like uh, the physical entities science explains. So we don't have any causal relations with mathematical entities. So two plus two is four is as true as uh, Oliver Twist uh, uh, was born in London, that this is false. And then Michael David and Alex Rosenberg. And look at what Rosenberg says now. Science forces upon upon us a very disillusioned take on reality. It forces us to say no in response to many questions to which almost everyone hopes the answers are yes. These are, look at the questions he says no. These questions, these are the questions about purpose in nature, the meaning of life, the grounds of morality, the significance of consciousness, the character of thought, the freedom and the will, the limits of human self-understanding and the trajectory of human history. Nothing is left but natural science. Um, this view, as I assume you can suspect, has problems. Uh, well, the first one is called the placement problem. Okay, uh, what should we, we think about the feature, the feature that common sense and the perceptual realist view of the world uh, tell us, you know, that they are so important for our lives, right? Uh, so normative phenomena, free will, self-consciousness, phenomenological properties, collective intentionality, financial debts. That's I do. This is uh, uh, suggested to me by Barry Smith, the Buffalo Barry Smith, Buffalo, another philosopher from Buffalo, that says, you know, how can you explain financial debts only using the natural sciences? I think it's right. And then even mathematical truths, I truths, I was as I was saying. Uh, so strict nationalism encompasses an imperialistic version of scientific realism such that you either reduce all these phenomena to uh, scientific phenomena or you say they are illusions. Uh, so there is a lot of, uh, for example, who people uh, in the audience who have studied free will know that there are many people nowadays that say free will is an illusion and so it's moral responsibility because it cannot be accounted by in uh, naturalistic terms. Um, and this is Searle, now kind of unfamous. How can we, can we square a conception of ourself as mindful, meaning creating free, rational, et cetera, agents with a universe that consists entirely of mindless, meaningless, unfree, non-rational, brute physical particles? This is, sounds like a generalization of Kant's, Kant's third antinomy, clearly. Uh, uh, what Kant asked about free will, freedom is, can be asked about every, feature of the agential view of the world. What happened to that in a, in a world that is only composed by physical entities, okay? And the answer is very unsatisfactory. Uh, now, a consequence of this, this is an aside, brief aside, but I think it's important. They, the philosophers are doing harakiri here. Uh, um, so, because too many grant that science can, is autonomous, for science doesn't need philosophy. Science can explain everything. This is Daniel Dennett, who's friend of the scientists, but also uh, it's, uh, it's clear that science can not be the, on the only thing. There is no such a thing as a philosophy-free science, he writes. There is only science whose philosophical baggage is taken on board without examination. Today, there are mad doc reductionist neuro neuroscientists and philosophers who insist that minds are illusions, pains are illusions, dreams are illusions, ideas are illusions. All there is um, is just neurons, glia, and the like, okay? And these are philosophical questions that are intrinsic to science. What is a biological species? What are the interpretation of quantum mechanics that we should accept? Uh, what is the epistemological value of string theory? As you know, string theory that most uh, theoretical physicists are studying nowadays doesn't have any 
empirical application. So what is its epistemological value? Is time objective? Uh, how should we study the qualia? Uh, uh, should we put limits, ethical limits to genetic uh, uh, engineering and so on? All these are philosophical questions that science has to acknowledge as philosophical. And this is to close, to close this, uh, to end this, uh, this uh, aside, look at what Stephen Hawking with Mladenov has, has, has written. Philosophy is dead, he says, and uh, it has not kept us with modern developments in science, particularly physics. And then Tim Crane, an excellent British philosopher, has written a, a very instructive, destructive, destructive and destructive review of this book by Hawking. Hawking, sorry, the writing that uh, contains a large amount of arguments in defense of its own metaphysics and its philosophy of science, and they, they are very low standards and it shows a striking lack of reflection on the complexity of what is being claimed. In one word, science, this idea that science tells us everything is very dangerous also because scientists unavoidably do philosophy by themselves. This philosophy cannot ask, add anything to, to their thinking. Why should they listen to philosophers? And the result is a very bad book about the world. Um, so, final world, I'm almost there, about liberal naturalism. So, liberal naturalism, I think, is the best way of defending pluralistic realism nowadays. Um, so, here are the three liberalized tenets of liberal naturalism. Um, some real, one is a liberalized ontological tenet, tenet. Some real entities exist that are irreducible to, but not incompatible with, the entities that are part of the coverage domain of a science-based ontology. So uh, I am a person besides being a body. I am moral responsibility, I free will, I obey to norms. All this is reducible, but it's not incompatible with science. Uh, and then epistemology, right? And a liberalized epistemological tenets. Some legitimate forms of understanding, like a prior, prior reasoning or introspection, are neither reducible to scientific understanding nor incompatible with it. Um, and then a liberalized metaphilosophical tenet. There are issues in dealing with which philosophy is not continued with science as to its content, method, and purpose, uh, even if it should not be at odds with it. So. Um, Studying free will, free will is a gal galaxy of different problems. For some of these problems, philosophy has to work together with science. For example, the issue, uh, is the world deterministic or indeterministic? That's something that philosophy philosophers cannot solve by, by not looking at the sciences. But other things like, uh, is compatibilism a consistent view? This is a purely philosophical view and um, problem. It doesn't appeal to science at all, okay? Um, and I think that this framework here generates a resolutely pluralistic attitude in ontology, in epistemology, and in philosophy itself. Uh, in this sense, um, this view is deeply anti Occamian. Uh, uh, but even Occam, I, would, would, I think, could grant that when it's necessary, you have to be a pluralist. Uh, okay, a couple of slides more. First, some metaphysical remarks. Uh, I think uh, that between the future of the perceptual world and those of the scientific world, there is a relation of global supervenience. This means that in two uh, physically identical worlds, you would have the same uh, features, but there is no possibility uh, also same features of the perceptual world, but there is no way of reducing everything of the, that the word perceptual world talks about, the perce um, perceptual view of the world talks about to the, uh, the features of the scientific world. Uh, mental states cannot be reduced to physical states when you talk at properties or types of mental states. Only tokens are identical to physical, mental tokens are identical to physical tokens, but not mental properties. Um, the properties of the macroscopic world depend for their existence on the existence of the properties of the scientific world. Okay, this is uh, kind of the link. There is a dependence. Uh, my being a person wouldn't be real if I didn't have a body. The objects of the mesoscopic and macroscopic world are constituted by, but are not identical to the physical features that constitute them. Uh, Lee, my dear friend, Lynn Baker was a 
strong advocate of this view that I find convincing. In some contexts, we are allowed to conceive of abstract entities as real, for example, in mathematics. Um, not with, I mean, even Quine had to accept um, the existence of abstract entities that for him would be normally entia non grada, because uh, we, you know, we had to accept that they exist even if we don't have any causal relations with them. But so knowing mathematics requires some epistemological attitude that is not the same of the natural sciences, where there is no way of contemplating the numbers of the sets. There is no such a thing, finally, as a fact value dichotomy. Um, as Patra wrote once, uh, values or the normative is ubiquitous. The normative is everywhere. Of course, we you can distinguish uh, fact and values, but there is no dichotomy because um, even when we look at the world, we use uh, our values. Even science, this is a famous example by Patram himself again. Uh, he says, uh, we choose between different uh, uh, scientific theories also because of their epistemic properties, right? Epistemic properties are still normative properties. So one is more elegant or uh, explains more or uh, as value, right? These are values and we prefer that theory and we cannot detach these things from, from the theory and say, okay, this is the naked theory without this because that's not, uh, um, Quine himself told us that you cannot distinguish the different parts of a theory, right? Theory uh, uh, faces reality as a whole. Uh, scientific theories confront with reality as a whole. It's not that you say, okay, this is analytic, this is synthetic, this is a value, this is a fact. You have to judge the whole thing. You can rearrange it uh, in, a, uh, in, in different ways uh, when uh, in, um, experience is not what we expected, uh, but it's not what, what the facts are, what the new naked facts are is not objective. They are always uh, full of theory, theory, um, th uh, sorry, value laden. So uh, value, normativity are everywhere. And last remarks, uh, that's important even with, because I, now I've granted that there is a methodology or an ontology or an epistemology in science, nothing like that. Uh, there's not one ontology in science, not one methodology. The dream of Popper and the uh, logical empiricists is, is, you know, is, uh, out. There, there is nothing like that. There is not a common method in uh, uh, chemistry or in uh, psychology, in uh, microphysics uh, and in entomology. There are a lot of ontologies, a lot of methodologies. And look, it's interesting that nowadays, if you look at the scientists and the philosophers who do specific fields in science, uh, they mo the vast majority of them are pluralists in ontology. Uh, even in chemistry, most uh, philosophers of chemistry down don't think that chemistry is not reducible to physics. This is a form of emergentism, right? Um, also, uh, so there are excellent reasons, as I said, for using a liberalized ontological criterion. Uh, we should liberalize Quine's uh, criteria. We should accept the entities that our best theories uh, contemplate, but our best theories are not necessarily the only the theories of the natural sciences. Uh, sometimes our best theories could be the common sense or human sciences or social sciences. Um, that's another point I didn't have much time to touch. Causal pluralism recommends itself. Causal pluralism is something that uh, the refusal which the refusal which doomed Davidson, uh, for example, Davidson's anomalous monism. Davidson had the good idea about the relationship between the, the mind and the brain, or the mind and the physical world, more correctly. Um, so the, uh, the supervenience, but he didn't accept the idea that there are different forms of causation, depending on the um, interest you have when you ask the question, why? He didn't grant that. He granted that there is only, uh, physical causation and the result what they this view and almost monism collapsed on epiphenomenalism. That is a very bad thing. Uh, so I, I uh, believe that uh, the pragmatists and many, uh, I think perhaps all uh, liberal naturalists would agree with me uh, that you should accept the idea that there, is, there are different causes of phenomena and they, what is the right cause depend on the context in which you ask the question why. So depends on your interest. Um, 
So this means, sorry, the uh, refusal of the new, so-called neo-human view of causation for which every single causal relation has to exemplify a law of physics. And this is what uh, really uh, give truth to your causal statement. This has to be refused. And then I think a reflexive equilibrium should be looked for when uh, these two views of the world, the, the perceptual and the scientific one are at odds. That's frequent. I don't think that, for example, Hugh Price said when there is a conflict, unavoidably science wins to compare with the common sense or philosophy or the, uh, or the social sciences or whatever. I don't think so. I think that it depends on the issues. In some cases, philosophy can say something to the sciences and this happened in the past and will happen in the future. Not always, but sometime. So uh, my final conclusion that it's a good thing that uh, some philosophers nowadays are putting together um, naturalism and pluralism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mario. Uh, let us see. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to moderate the uh, questions and uh, comments from the audience. What I would ask that you do, because there's uh, the easiest way for me to do this, is if you would be willing to use the chat function on the bottom of your screen, and. Um, if you just uh, send me a chat, I can call on you uh, personally to state your question, or if you wish, you can state the question and I can ask it, but feel free to just uh, send me a, uh, a chat. And I see we have a question from uh, Ed Halper. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. That was very, very nice paper. I appreciate it a lot. I have, um, it's a little bit of a complicated question. I'm going to try to formulate it succinctly and intelligible. I'm going to start with, with Spinoza, who's obviously a monist of sort. And Spinoza has this discussion about the, the sun. And he says the sun looks like a small ball in the sky. However, um, scientifically, it's actually much larger. But uh, it's not the, this is the dichotomy that you were talking about in the paper, but then Spinoza goes another step further and says, we need to explain why it looks as it does. And there has to be a kind of scientific explanation for that. So it, it seems to me that, that anyone who's a serious monist and a scientific realist is going to say, um, the perceptual experience needs to be explained scientifically. And anybody who is um, saying, well, your perceptual experience is just all nonsense and wrong, is not a monist at all. He's actually a dualist. There's the scientific reality, and then there's this other stuff that is somehow going on but can't be accounted for by science. So I, I want to say, you know, my first question is, yeah, you, you've got it upside down. And then the second one is, if it turns out that there is some aspect, I'm not of, sure I understood what the, the first question it was about Spinoza particularly. Yes, well, it was not just Spinoza, but it's, it's just I just using a Spinoza as an example for the general the general problem here. The the the, the problem is that any 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 mo scientific monist who is a scientific realist should be able to account for perceptual experience, the, the way things that exist. It's part of the world. And if you're a monist, you've got to be able to account for that. So, okay. so that the people that you were saying were monists and they're dismissing experience, they turn out to be dualists, uh, as I would say, and Spinoza would say. And, 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 and on the other hand, the other part of the question is, if it's the case that there is some part of experience that can't be explained scientifically, uh, that's a scientific problem. Um, and one of the things that can't be explained very well is, is this, as you said, this kind of uh, macro experience that we have of macro objects. Um, but that's a, you know, that's a scientific uh, challenge. So I, I guess I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether, you, whether you've got the, 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 the cast of characters right, that the people you, you're claiming to be Monists seem to me to be dualists of people you're claiming to be sort of liberal and having 
sort of like yourself and multiple perspectives, um, I'm I'm wondering if that really makes any sense of science or makes any sense of the world or isn't does it represent a kind of challenge for uh, for the understanding of nature to explain things that don't readily come under nature. Okay, that's a, that's interesting. There are uh, one premise because I mentioned Spinoza as a naturalist that wouldn't be considered a naturalist nowadays, and the reason for that I didn't explain would be that of the because of the um, uh, uh, modal force of his system. So necessity is an essential component of. Uh, Spinoza's system, besides, of course, this idea that the world is eternal and so on. So to your questions, look, I, it is not me that describes these people are monists, it is them. And the idea is this, you have the physical world. Some people like Searle would say, oh, no, no, there is not only the physical world, there is also the biological world, but still the world of the sciences, the natural sciences. And then there are all these other phenomena. Uh, so free will, uh, uh, consciousness, responsibility, values, normativity, blah, 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 intentionality. And they say, okay, this is a problem. And they see two strategies here. They think, okay, well, well you look, this is like um, water, right? What is water? H2O. What is consciousness? There is some activation of the brain. So we have simply to reduce this. And so this is an attempt to reduction. Um, this is one way. Um, and this reduction generally don't work very well. And so some other people like uh, the churchlands that are strong money say, okay, let's face it. The mental system doesn't exist at all. It's a wrong theory of the mind. Let's forget it, eliminationism. And this is also true for, for uh, uh, free will. But I think uh, in the back of your question was this, this uh, answer, how can you really eliminate all these things? Like Rosenberg, right? Rosenberg says there are only atoms. Yeah, but how can you explain uh, all the other features of the world if you only talk about atoms. Um, so some look, some scientific natural, strict naturalists would agree with you and with me perhaps, because I think that this premise is common to us. How can you think you really, uh, you reduce or eliminate all this stuff? And these are the Mysterians like Chomsky or McGinn or Van Wagen in some, or Nagel. They say, of course there has to be a naturalistic explanation of why there is free will and blah, 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 but we are not smart enough to solve it. So in some sense, they take some, let's say, uh, pluralist view. Okay, free will is there, we cannot reduce it, but only because we are ignorant how we could be reduced. This is their view. And as to the uh, liberal naturalist view is, no, there are different layers of the world, like Aristotle, right? There are different forms in the world. And they are not re mutually reducible, even if they are composed by the, the, the upper level are composed by the lower level. I repeat, I exist as a person. And so the, I have properties that my atoms don't have, but without my atoms, I wouldn't exist. This is a, I think a form of um, ontological pluralism and epistemological also, of course, because in order to study the different layers, you need different um, epistemological, uh, different uh, theories, different views. So I think uh, I, I think we should move on to the next question. Owen Golden. Thank you. And thank you for a very, very interesting paper. Um, I, I'd like to just try to um, clarify your position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Sellers, whom you uh, present as a paradigm of, a, of an illiberal naturalist, because Sellers has this distinction between the manifest image and the scientific image. The manifest image being the worldview of the phenomenologists and Aristotle, middle-sized objects, moral norms, all the rest of it, all of the things that you're defending. And Sellers says this kind of philosophy is wonderful, it's important, it should keep going, it's useful, but then he, he does have this priority for what he calls the scientific image. If you wanna know what really is, what, they're, what we're really on logical committed Two, it's going to be the symbols of the scientific image. So if we just change what it means for something to have ontological standing, if we say that a useful, worthy, intelligible account of the world has uh, certain ontological commitments at whatever level, so the manifest image will too, does that translate into your view or it, or will there be differences? In other words, my question is: Is your your distinct your 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 um, 
disagreement with sellers simply on what it means to be. Yep. What kinds of things we give ontological, but everything else seems very, very close to sellers. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's uh, not just me, right? Think about uh, McDowell, who was, well, I don't gave a talk in this, in this uh, context some point, or Brandon that, you know, come out of him, of course, and have this idea. Simply, let's give up the idea that there is a basic ontological view that says, according to which there are no table, there are no persons. The other things I agree with you, um, they exist. They are, um, it, without that, that particular axiom, things are fine with sellers. He also is clearly has clearly a difficulty here because he wants a stereoscopic view, right? But then this stereoscopic view becomes too narrow to the looking at the bottom, right? That's the idea. But I, I agree with you. There is a lot in sellers that is very important there. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Karsten? Karsten Stuber has a question. Okay, thanks, Mario. Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, you know that uh, I'm very sympathetic, uh, but I mean, when you talk about perceptual realism, uh, I just was wondering, uh, I, I vaguely remember my uh, German romantics, and when they looked at nature, uh, they always see a lot of things in there, uh, the absolute and it's quite fun reading, uh, and they seem to be quite persuasive at times. Uh, but I assume you don't want to go there. Uh, so I, I assume then the, the the constraining element is is really causal pluralism. Do I get you right there? That is, and and I I'm very sympathetic to that in the sense that uh, we can actually uh, have causal relations. Uh, and causal explanations on, on various levels. Uh, and, and unless an entity can play a role in some kind of causal explanatory context, so if I can kick it and manipulate it, it's real, uh, would, that be, would that be the constraining factor that you, uh, or even, would that even be too restrictive? Because sometimes you would talk about abstract entities being real. So I, I just wanted to get a, a clearer view of the constraining criteria that you use. Oh, that's interesting, uh, Karsten. So um, you had this, uh, from hacking this idea, if you can you know, interact with it, it's real. I agree, unless you can reduce it. But as I said, there are not many reductions about the interesting features of the world. Um, I agree with you about causation. I would add one thing. We don't want, first, that's obvious. We don't want a philosophical theories that imply the violation of scientific laws as we assume there are. So for example, the idea that you know there are miracles. People can believe in miracles. I wouldn't call them a liberal naturalist. They would be supernaturalists. So this one thing, first, if they, you accept miracles, you cannot be called a liberal naturalist anymore. Too liberal. <laughs> Some people would have an idea of, um, of uh, would call that naturalist, but it's too broad for me. And the other thing is not just that. Uh, when a philosophy wants to enter in something that de science is dealing with very well, uh, even if you are not inconsistent with it, uh, that could be too much. A simple example, the intelligent design Intelligent design is more or less a philosophical view that says that, you know, something is missing in, uh, in uh, uh, the theory of natural selection. Let's add God intervention to explain the existence of humans, right? Um, that's too much because this the uh, Darwin's theory works enough for explaining an evolution. So I'm adding this because theoretically there is not real logical conflict there between intelligent design and Darwin theory, but there is no necessity to add it because what scientists want, it's you know, completely given by Darwin. Um, so these are more or less, but we agree, I think, Kirsten. Okay, we have a question now from uh, Tim Eastman. Uh, if I may, uh, yes. so as, a, as a practicing scientist, uh, I'm uh, you know, sort of uh, on one hand, a uh, a broad naturalist like yourself. Uh, one thing I'm definitely not is a strict naturalist, and I think few practicing scientists are strict naturalists uh, in that sense. They, you find some philosophers that might be, but a practicing scientist is rather careful to distinguish the models and the systems themselves. Uh, an example of this is brought out clearly in Robert Rosen's work on systems theory, uh, where he makes a clear distinction of 
models and their approximations and the systems themselves. And uh, so it seems to me that that's a key thing that uh, needs to be incorporated in a proper philosophical understanding uh, to make that distinction of the models and proposition about the models versus propositions about uh, about the uh, the things you're modeling. Uh, and, and the strict naturalists, naturalists appear to be conflating those in a way that's uh, incorrect. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. Um, one thing I've mentioned, I don't know if this goes in the same direction, I agree with what you said, is the notion of approximation to truth, right? That's uh, one has to be careful with that uh, because it's clear that our theory, no theory is perfect probably. Now, not scientific theory, so it doesn't model the world as it is exactly. But for example, uh, there are interesting, there is interesting work like by Pete Tillis about the notion of uh, approximation to truth of scientific theories there that has to be explored. But that's another, another important issue about why sci scientific philosophers should be prudent, right? Because as you said, one thing is our models, another thing is reality. There is always kind of that's what's po your point, I think, kind of a gap there, right? Um, so I totally agree with that. We have a question from Michelle Mahoney next. Um, thank you very, very much for um, a fantastic breadth of the topic. The development of these ideas are so important right now, particularly. Um, I study Peirce and I have worked quite extensively on his semiotics in light of its anti alchemistic position that ideas uh, are, are real and they support intelligibility itself, which makes, uh, makes him put logic in the service of the validity of scientific ideas in every regard on the basis of falsification. Um, do you, can you comment on what you think of Peirce in terms of the support of, of plurality of causations in your, in your work, please? I saw that after you there is Professor Cola Pietro that would will be would be more expert than me in answering this question, but certainly um, I think uh, uh, Percy is on the right side here. Um, perhaps could be for you know contemporary standards a little too uh, metaphysics metaphysical in some in some of his uh, expressions, but still uh, certainly is a champion of pluralism. And uh, so is an example for us. And perhaps uh, also about truth, his view of truth, I prefer very much to the view of truth of James and, tr and uh, Dewey that are, you know, to, uh, really truth becomes something that is just utility, blah, blah, blah. I prefer the idea that the, or the ideal convergence of the experts on some issue. That's a very interesting idea of truth. So in some sense, uh, it's my favorite pragmatist and I love pragmatists. So. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Vincent Colapietro. Vincent, would you would you speak to us? Quickly, uh, thank you for that presentation. No science without scientism, scientist. No scientist without personal agents who hold themselves and others accountable for what they say, et cetera, for what they observe. Is this not, in your judgment, the Achilles heel of any form of illiberal naturalism. Thank you. That's a fair point, of course. Now, it's not that would convince the uh, strict naturalist, but co convince us very much, right? I think that um, science itself, of course, scientists themselves are agents that interact in the world. If you think of this idea that they take for real, how do they science? They use their uh, normative thinking, they use your bodies, their interaction with the others, and at some point all this disappears and they are left only with this uh, world that doesn't leave any space for them as agents. I totally agree with that. And uh, science itself, also, there is a sense in which science itself needs, uh, uh, in order to exist, uh, the ordinary view of the world. And is the, the difference here between me and uh, me and many other liberal naturalists and, and sellers is sellers at some point struggle, but it said the science could be detached from all this background. And I think that cannot ever be done really. Hmm. Thank you. And uh, now we have a question from John Stewart. Thank you, Larry. Thanks for that presentation. I thought that was great. Um, my question is this. 
do you believe that there are any theory neutral or metaphysical neutral criteria for assessing the truth or falsity of metaphysical theories like your varieties of naturalism? And if so, what are they? And if not, what are the implications for your support for pluralistic naturalism? Okay, that's a meta-metaphysical nowadays, mm. right? Meta-metaphysics, a good meta-metaphysical uh, thing. I don't think, I think that we should, in order to evaluate metaphysics, we should also look, compare the metaphysical views with our lives. I don't think you should only stay inside metaphysics, right? And I think liberal naturalism accounts better for our practices than the other forms of naturalism. Uh, the, than strict naturalism. So I wouldn't have an, ins an answer that would be neutral inside metaphysics, uh, a meta-metaphysical way of solving the conflicts there. I would look at reality, how we do, how we live. Would you live in a world in which uh, you would say, okay, we cannot explain free will, let's give it up. I don't think so, honestly. Um, so my answer is, the, the, the uh, answer here, the solution is not at the meta-metaphysical meta level, it's at the practical level. Do I sense a follow-up? Well, yes. just to follow up, do you think that the people with whom you disagree believe that their views are impractical? Do you think that they hold those views because they think they're wildly at odds with their own practices? No, I'm, asking you, I'm asking you what to do when those experiences are contested. Yeah, but that's what happens in all philosophical debates, right? That it, normally, I think that when argues in philosophy against someone, you will never really uh, convince those people. You, the ideal audience for our discussions is a neutral person, someone who wants to say, okay, what kind of naturalness should I endorse? And so I would say to that person, not to my opponent, look at what they say, look at what Rosenberg says. Rosenberg says that there are only atoms, okay? Um, but he doesn't give any idea how we should deal with our attributions of responsibility, uh, how you could reduce that moral properties to physical properties. He only says there are only atoms. He is the most consistent here. Actually, no, the most consistent is, is on the basis of Chomsky's, Chomsky's view is McGinn that says, okay, I would like to reduce everything, but nothing can be reduced to these issues. I agree with him, it's fair, but then they cannot be eliminated and that's fair as well. And then he concludes, so they are mysteries. But no, they are not mysteries, Colin. The only point is that let's take it as this, his views as a modus tollens. His, his premise that everything has to be explained by the natural sciences is too strong. That's my view. But uh, your idea that they would, certainly they wouldn't grant that. No, no philosopher would grant that their view are wrong. I agree with you, or that they are inconsistent with practice. But a neutral spectator could. Jason Kabatak. Jason, you have the floor. Awesome, thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, uh, cool question. Uh, does your theory require a context through which different entities cohere? Uh, another way to ask this is, what is the basis for relationship between these different entities? Or what is the ground for difference? Okay, so you, I assume that entities, you mean entities at the different levels. Yeah, um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, that's a fair question. Um, I, I told you that um, the great big problem of scientific, strict naturalism is the placement problem, right? Where should we place, you know, free will, responsibility, normativity in the world that has only physical properties? The analog problem for liberal naturalism, and perhaps uh, some of you were going in that direction, I've called the reconciliation problem. How to put all this together, right? Uh, how to put the level of normativity with the level of nomological uh, explanations of science, this kind of thing. How put you put together? It's clear that it's not. Uh, that's an open problem. There are three, three. I think ways of answering that. One is kind of an Kantianist without the noumena approach. Um, Akil Bilgrami has this, for example. So the idea is there is there are different ways of looking at reality that are incommensurable, more or less. Different perspective of reality. So it's like you are looking from. Uh, the human being as an agent or a human being as a, a body. And these are two different ways. They are irreconcilable, but they, you know, um, are all natural because there are no, no women out there. That's everything that there is, is there. That's one way. I'm, I'm not very happy with that. Then there is the emergentistic way, the canonic one. So the idea that when uh, the features of the world or the, some level has 
uh, uh, reach a level of aggregation that's so complicated, the new entity, a new entity emerges that has new properties irreducible to the lower level. That's standard view. Uh, the problem with this view is that they see this new levels has mysteriously generated. And then there is this more peaceful view of global supervenience that says there are upper level. Think about um, Donald Davidson view of the mental without the uh, principle of a physical closure of the world is a good example. So every single mental uh, event, uh, especially intentional mental events, like I believe something, is correspond to something in the world because of external, it is not just a brain state, but it's a physical state. Take each single brain of a mental event corresponded to a physical state, but the family, the type of this, the same uh, mental event, like, I don't know, Kabul is the capital of uh, uh, Afghanistan, the two different token there of this mental type do necessarily correspond to a physical type. That's an idea. This is global supervenience. I think it's the best way of uh, relating the different levels of reality. Okay. We have, uh, I think, two more questions. One is from Jessica Wallman. Um, hi, thank you very much for this talk. I'm very sympathetic to it as uh, both a naturalist and a pragmatist. And I actually just kind of want to uh, jump back in if I could on the discussion about you know your use of sort of the the practicality for want of a better word the practical the sensible effects <laughs> uh, as a criterion for for theories um, I think there's I think there's a stronger case to be made against the people who disagree with you um, of course they may not say what they do is impractical but they frequently use practicality right as they frequently misunderstand practicality as a a cheap justification for a theory. Rather, I mean, I, when, when I'm feeling most dismissive, I say that the scientific naturalists are really engaging in Peirce's a priori method. They just take scientific dogma as their religious authority and deduce from there. So, I mean, I think I think there actually is a difference between what you're advocating um, and what some of the scientific naturalists would use to justify their own theories. And I'd love to know what you think about that. Jessica, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> cool. <laughs> you have said perfectly what I, I thought deeply. Yeah, thank you very much. I okay, cannot cool. add. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I look forward to talking to you more. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that would this, be great. This is what happens at the Metaphysical Society. Uh, <laughs> we have another question from George Lucas. George. Yes. Um, down. Good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you. Professor Caro for that terrific talk. Um, I'm not sure whether to raise this question uh, about a Kantian antinomy in the midst of all the pragmatists we have here um, who um, seem comfortable with uh, leaving antinomies alone and uh, uh, letting us struggle with them as best we can. I'm just curious uh, on your thoughts about Kant's particular and I think special treatment uh, of the antinomy of free will and determinism vis-a-vis -vis the other three antinomies he discusses in the critique of pure reason. Those others are irresolvable, ir irreconcilable, and left at that, leaving him a kind of, I suppose, uh, you know, not, not merely anti-metaphysical, but uh, very practical. Um, the, Freedom, however, he, for obvious reasons in his wider architectonic, he's unwilling to give up on. It ends up that he treats that antinomy differently uh, and has definite conclusions that he draws about the nature of free will. Uh, namely, in the second critique, freedom is a fact of reason. Um, but we've still left, whatever that's supposed to mean, um, determinism is still a fact of science in Kant. So in your categories, does that make him, you know, as we look back at that discussion, does that qualify Kant as a liberal naturalist in your view? The, 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 uh, and how are we to think of those two levels of explanation that he seems to accept with regard to freedom? Thank you very much, George. That's a great question. Um, so what, uh, certainly Kant is an inspiration for liberal naturalists, but his uh, appeal to noumena 
is um, totally unconvincing, especially here in regard to free will, I think. That's of course crucial in his system. Actually, it seems that the antinomies, especially the antinomy on freedom, was the, the original source of inspiration for his uh, uh, critics. So the point is, uh, there is a thesis uh, there is no free. Uh, they, we we need freedom to understand uh, to explain responsibility, so it's indispensable. And in the antithesis, freedom is impossible. And then in the critique of pure uh, uh, practical reasons, practically it reaffirms the thesis: we freedom is indispensable. But as you said, the ontological problem is still there, and the answer is now convincing because for two reasons, I think. First, this idea that we have to thought to be thought as causas we in order to attribute freedom to people. That's, for me at least, for my limited intelligence, it, almost an, an, uh, incomprehensible because what is cosmission out of space time? Do you remember, uh, no women are out of space time and causality is a category of the intellect. No women don't have any of those and still should have a causal effect on the, for, on the um, phenomenal level. And the other way, phenomenological level. And the other one is this, um, Kant grants that, of course, he's a determinist as Newtonian, so um, there is a physical cause of every action. That's sufficient. So what, what does the nomena add to that if it's already sufficient? Okay, there are some explanations there, like we should see the nomena action as the sum of all the causal history starting from the beginning up to that. And this is summarized in the, in the action of the nomena, but that's, I think, is wild metaphysics so <laughs> okay. I, I think we have time for one more question from lisa lando hedrick hi Unless... thank you so much that was wonderful um so i i apologize if this gets us a little off topic from um the direction that these questions have been going but i have a question if you could uh, about how you uh, account for certain movements that say new materialist movements in science and technology studies and the contemporary social sciences that are tending towards new animisms, right? Which are motivated by ethnographic research and indigenous encounters um, to get away from the sort of modernist framing of the problem of naturalism, right? A, a problem of where you place certain phenomena um, and, and the way that that's created different um, sort of what Latour calls fiefdoms of criticism, right? So uh, how would you relate or accommodate the work of say, Eduardo Viveros de Castro's and his uh, movement towards multinaturalisms by way of a critique of this very idea of what you call the placement problem? Yeah, I think that the point there is, there are two issues quickly, two points. The first is, I'm a pluralist also as to the social sciences, and there is the big, big debate between people who want to naturalize the social sciences, anthropology in particular, and some people who do not want to, start like them, like the ones you mentioned, that do not want to naturalize them. And I'm a pluralist, so they are both uh, allowed to go the way they want. Um, but as to the specific issue you mentioned, it's a, a way of understanding nature, right? They have a different a way. So they are di different way of naturalists because they are different way of what nature is. And that's exactly going in the same direction I'm going. We have to be pluralist about what nature is. It's not one thing can be uh, understood in different ways, uh, depending on the point of view you look at yourself. So I totally agree with that. Thank you. Uh... Thank you all for wonderful questions and a terrific session. I just want to say uh, we're going to break off now. And uh, at 1145 and 15 minutes is the next plenary session. That's our Aristotle plot prize lecture and uh, by Jeffrey Speaks. And it will be moderated by Bob Neville. But before we end, I just want to once again remotely thank Mario DiCaro for his uh, presence here. <laughs>